Hey, and welcome back. So that's where we're going, but first, let's check out where I've been. While this has been a good vice, it does lack capacity as evidenced by the fact that I used it for a very long time without the fixed jaw being in place. And of course, now that I'm done using it, I've made a fixed jaw for it. And in its former life, it was used pretty hard. Now this little guy here has been a real lifesaver. It's very precise and it has a wide opening, but it lacks rigidity just like the previous vise. And this one, this one here is just a drill press vise posing as a milling vise. So let's put this in terms that's easy to understand. That is a Yugo. This one, it's more like a light truck. You pick the brand, any brand. I would call this one a Camaro, an RS, not an SS. <laughs> So I know what you're thinking already. Yeah, that's a $1,500 vice. Of course it's all that in sliced bread too. But actually, I paid much less than any used milling vice on eBay that's similar to this. And I didn't have to pay some crazy shipping price. That's because I went to the auction. Now I had to buy three vices to get that price. But I'm sure that I'll have no problem getting rid of the other two. The shop that this came from had a lot of CNC machines, so it looked like they built this setup from new and used it to run whatever part it was they were making, and when they were done, they pulled it out of the machine. And despite their appearance, they're in really great condition, and I'm pretty sure they were never used for any other setup than this. That's several hundred pounds of metal, and they forklift loaded it for me whenever I was at the shop, and then whenever I got home, I downloaded it with the tractor and parked it in the garage overnight the odor permeated the entire shop and it was just unbearable so needless to say the first thing i did after breaking everything down so i could handle it by hand was put it in the tractor bucket hosed it with purple power and rinsed it with water for what seemed like an hour to get all the chips out and i still didn't manage to do that as you can see by the bolt holes here and of course I caused that surface rust from all that but no big deal after the thorough decon was complete I broke one of them apart in just a few minutes and just a testament to how well these vices are designed and built sealed is that whenever they were on this fixture plate they would only open and close about one or two turns just enough to be able to get the part in and out of the fixture and just packed full of chips is amazing how well they could stand up to that kind of usage this is as far as i disassembled the vise there is a clip that goes right here that is kind of unique i've never seen any kind of clip like that and i was unable to take it apart and it's not shown on this diagram it's not number 10 but it's the clutch mechanism which is 11, 12, and 13. If you've ever taken that apart before or you know about it, please leave a comment below and let us know. Despite the fact that I didn't take that apart, I was able to flush it thoroughly and get it to come clean and lubricate it. That's the remainder of the parts from disassembly. And even though Kurt doesn't make this vice anymore, they still offer this as a service kit on their website. I'll save you from all the scotch brighting and just say that once I got to this point, it cleaned up very easily. Still a little bit of etching on the surface from the coolant and all the fixturing, but hey, it's in great condition still. All of the holes that are in the casting are factory from Kurt with the exception of four holes that are in the top of the bed that were used for mounting the fixturing. And who knows, maybe those holes were done by Kurt as well, as they do make custom fixtures. So I don't know if they made it or if it was made by the shop that I got it from. There's also five additional holes in each job, but I think that's actually going to work to my advantage in the future. This is a double lock vise, so just means that the jaws float and come to the center and there's a fixed jaw in the center. In this case, it's the fixture, but normally it would just be a straight jaw that goes into that recess. Like this, but I'm not really that interested in using it as a dual station vise. I would rather use it like this, which Kirk calls a conversion kit. 
Pretty cool how these jaws float. There's a hemispherical piece inside the jaw that the screwdriver is pointing at, and there's a set screw on the back side of the jaw that adjusts the amount of float to the nut that's inside the vice body. And Kurt says to snug that up and then back it off like an eighth of a turn and get the float set right so that the vice doesn't bind up. I'd like to see how they make that. There's the aftermath of final cleaning just one of those jaws. Man, that had a lot of chips in it. Everything all cleaned up and ready to assemble. Kurt uses a special lithium grease made by Mobile that's XHP222 Special. And it's made specifically for CNC environments where you're using coolant. I'm not doing that, so I'm just using regular white lithium grease. Alright, so back to this clutch mechanism that I didn't take apart. So a little bit of a trick here to get this to compress so you can get snap ring 10 installed or taken off is to put it in the vise like this. I don't know how else you do that uh, unless you had some kind of a special fixture but you can see that it moves freely and I'm actually bouncing off of the spring in the the end there you'll you'll see that in a moment so I just compressed that enough to be able to get the snap ring back in place and again I didn't take off the internal snap ring or clip or detent or whatever it is on the inside of the shaft and yes I went back and cleaned that little bit of rust off it's amazing what you don't see with your eye that the camera does there's four springs inside that brass or bronze piece that I was bouncing off of whenever I was compressing uh, the shaft up and down. As well, there's a thrust bearing behind that, and whenever you have the collar installed, that sets the preload on the vise. Both nuts are O-ring sealed, so there's four seals in the assembly, and there's two of these spiral retaining rings that hold everything together, one on each nut. They can be a little fidgety to get started, but once you get it started, you just walk it around and it'll go right into place. Taking it off is super easy. You can just pop it with a screwdriver and walk it out. Much easier to deal with than traditional snap rings, which have a tendency to get pinched or bound up if they're in a high debris environment. Kurt makes a special tool for installing and removing this collar. But I didn't need it as everything was super clean and the threads are, are very good. So I just used the pick to get it back around to the spot where there's, a, there's an index where you can set the set screw to. The rear nut is really long and it's threaded all the way through to the bottom. So I spent a lot of time running it in and out just to make sure the grease was well distributed. And as you can see, it is very smooth. And there's a close-up of the spiral retaining ring. To get it started coming out, you just pop that little ledge with a screwdriver and walk it out. There are two cavities on either side of this collar, but only one of them gets a preload spring. So there's a little piece of, I don't know what kind of material it is, but it's flexible. It's like a type of rubber or plastic. And then there's a precision ground block that's exactly the right height. You put that on the right side as you're looking at the screw, and that sets the preload for the entire screw. Because it's under tension, you have to hold the rear nut stationary. And Kurt shows this being done with the vise assembled. In my case, I have holes there in the bed, so I just used a block of steel to hold the rear nut. And then once you do that, you can put in the retaining screw, back it off, and you can remove that. And the vise is pretty much assembled with the exception of getting the jaws installed and getting the float set. And as you can see, I have it timed correctly because the nuts are meeting right dead in the middle of the vice body. If you're using the vice in a double lock mode, you can actually clamp on dissimilar size parts and then retime the vice without disassembling it.
the six bolt holes here are what the conversion kit plate bolts to, which is just essentially a, a plate that holds the floating jaw stationary and makes the screw drive to the end. And here I've just got a random piece of metal holding it in place just so you can see how it works. All cleaned up and ready to go back to work. And how much does it weigh, do you say? Well, we'll just call that 33 pounds. And this one is 20 pounds. So for a 13 pound weight penalty, I get a massive increase in clamping. I'll take it. And speaking of clamping, I need to clamp it to the table. But as you can see, the vice body is four inches wide and it hits out just over the middle of my slots. So that's a little bit of a problem. Initially, my first thought was to make a subplate to mount it to, but after a little more thought, I decided to make some T-nuts, and you'll see how it works out in the end. For some reason, Rockwell decided that they would make the center slot deeper than the two outside slots. So the T-nuts are designed just to fit in the outside slots. I'm guessing that's just because they assume that's where you would mount your vices in the center slot. You rarely see this, but all of the hardware that was on the fixture was all marked with the bolt size on it, which I thought was unusual. So I've got the back bolt holes aligned over the back table slot and that gives me really good access to the horizontal spindle which is great. And Kurt considers the primary mounting location to be in the center of the vise as far as I can tell from all of the documentation I've read. I didn't have to search very far in my rack of randomness to find almost exactly what I need. Just needs a little modifying but the bolt hole actually lines up with the slot. Exactly. I bought a lot of random tools off of eBay and so the lot worked out to be about $5 a tool and one of those tools was a shop made fly cutter. I didn't really like the tool bit that came with it and I never used this particular cutter and I've been trying to change all of my tooling over to insert type tooling so I just cut it down and made it work. I've made a lot of cuts with this cutter since I cut it down. And so far, I haven't broken the insert or rotated it. Probably made at least 100 passes in steel and aluminum. And granted, it's supposed to be a finish cutter, but here I'm cutting like 20 thousandths on a piece of steel. It's a constant interrupted cut. You would think that it would fracture or break, but it's been holding up fine and it does a great job in aluminum, so really happy with that. Long life and it's cheap, and I can make a really big cut with it, so that's awesome. I thought this clip was a little bit funny. I just happened to get the RPM right on the spindle where it looks like the cutter is running backwards, but it's not. Just wait till the end where it spins down.
I'm tramming off of the horizontal spindle. I know from previous experience that I'll be good in the vertical as well whenever I do that. So I got everything snugged up and I pulled the vise back towards me against the toe clamp just slightly and then snugged down and got within a thousandth of being in tram. I was really surprised at that. And I repeated that a couple of times. So after minimal bumping around, I was able to get it to less than five tenths. Not sure exactly how much, maybe two or three tenths. And I've indicated it every which way and it's really, really square. It's probably the squarest thing within a 10 mile radius of my house. Kurt has a two page PDF for this particular vise and it shows you everything you need to know. That's all of the jaw configurations with the conversion kit and then all of the jaw configurations for the double lock setup. As well, it has all the dimensional data that you need to be able to make any fixtures, jigs, subplates, whatever it is you're trying to do. It's really handy. Since both the jaws are floating on this vise, it's not a centering vise. It needs something to square off against, and I tested that with a really square piece of material to see if it would square off, and it was inconsistent. I just needed to drill some holes in that plate so I could have a temporary conversion plate. All right, if you don't know, Lowe's is the place to go on Memorial Day. They always have toolboxes on sale on Memorial Day. So I got a real deal on this box. Really like it. Got all my collets and milling stuff all in one box. Really convenient right next to the machine. And I've become a fan of those kind of boxes that have a large opening at the top so you can put tall items in. So it's really good for the vices and, and whatnot, anything that's tall. You can really hear the difference in how stable this cutter is in the horizontal spindle versus the vertical spindle, which is part of the reason why I wanted this vise. The feed rate I was using there was more like a roughing pass, but look at that. That's pretty awesome. I set up a stop off of the side of the vise using the existing bolt holes with just a couple of random blocks and away you go. I need to make a proper stop, but that worked in a pinch. So after I got my jaw material squared up and cut to length using my on the fly stop, I faced all sides and I kept the parts oriented together every pass one of those passes I made a mistake can you guess what it was look at the way I've got it set up All right, jaws almost completed. Now on to making a proper conversion plate. Just trying to keep the chips out of the random holes. Not such a big deal on the fixed jaw, but the moving jaw here, it is a problem because the holes go all the way through to the bed and I found the vinyl cover for my ratchet so I'm not clinking the table. And if I need to move the vise a long distance, I can use the speed handle that's been collecting dust in my box for I don't know how many years. You probably got one too. In the past, I always removed the tooling and the holder from the horizontal spindle if I was using the vertical spindle because it was an interference problem with the vise. Don't really seem to be having that issue now, although there probably is some instances where it could be an interference, but now I'm able to just remove the tooling 
and leave the holder in place. I found a cap plug to go over it to keep the chips out while I'm using the vertical and it seems to be working great so far. Looks like the carbide is starting to give up on that insert just a little bit by that surface finish, but hey, it's okay. It's acceptable. Did you figure out what I did wrong on cutting these jaws yet? This is what I did wrong. I over tightened the vise just a little bit. Now I'm not using a torque wrench, so I don't know exactly how tight I'm tightening it, but I've got a pretty calibrated elbow, so I haven't been tightening it very tight, just snug. And on one of those passes, I tightened it enough to cause a one thousandth bow in the center of it, which I'll show you on the indicator here in a moment. But I had to go back and recut the jaw, and this is after I recut the fixed jaw. And then you'll see on the moving jaw the deviation that I removed from it as well. The last thing I did here was to make sure that the jaws were fully seated against the bed. And then I just made a light skimming pass making sure that I only cut on the first pass of the fly cutter and I stopped it and I moved the the moving jaw out of the way so I didn't get the swipe on the second side from the fly cutter and then just did the first pass on the other jaw as well and that's just ensuring that both jaws are exactly at the same height. Now I could trim them down they're about an eighth inch above the top surface of the jaws and you'll see uh, here in a moment that they are perfectly flat and uh, trammed to each other as well this surface is trimmed so I've got many options there I can remove the jaws I can leave the jaws in it's pretty awesome I love it so with the other vices I went from the situation where I was constantly having to figure out material and will it fit how can I make this work to a situation where I've got all the real estate in the world and I can do anything I want basically so that's really awesome there's so many configurations this thing can be put into is kind of bewildering I can make a center jaw if I want so I can use it in double lock mode or I can add a shelf to the fixed jaw and add another jaw to the rear moving jaw and get more real estate that way make some parallels so I can offset my work however I want and you can see plenty of room there I mean, it's just really awesome that's the max that I can close it not a problem just put a parallel in and if I need to do something really small I can use the Camaro here to get that done hey thanks for watching